legendary, legendary. This woman's legacy is legendary. And it's only appropriate that this story is being told under the supervision of someone I consider to be legendary. Yes. Legendary, award-winning writer, director, actress, executive producer, true journalist. Mm, come on. In every sense of the word. You can watch her work and rest assured that it's been heavily vetted. She put a lot of time and energy in it. She put a lot of love in it. It would not be finalized without her approval. I watched her work over the years. I recall briefly working with her one time on a project. I don't know how many years ago it was. <laughs> a lot, a lot of years ago. I was like, are you going to say <laughs> how long ago that Because I'm 25, yeah, okay. so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm 27, so I don't know how, you know. And so, um, and I just been, I marveled at your work. Every time you come up here, I'm going to tell you this. I appreciate it. I marvel it. at you. your work. It's very trustworthy. It's very necessary. You're telling the stories that we need to hear as a people. Um, as a nation in this documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks is premiering tomorrow on Peacock. And I want to welcome her back to the show, please, the amazing Soledad O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you. You are so necessary right now. I so appreciate it, but I really do have to tell you, there's a big, giant team of people who worked on this doc. We had terrific uh, producers and directors on this doc. Um, and it's from a book um, called, by the same name yes. called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, uh -huh. which Jean Theo Harris wrote. Jean and so Theo Harris, Jean yes. Jean would tweet mm -hmm. every year about here's all the things you don't know about Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. And one of our directors, Johanna Hamilton, started engaging with her on Twitter, which I kind of like the story because usually Twitter's just like a cesspool of yeah. horribleness. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And they started sharing this information. And so then uh, Joanna brought in a, a director, uh, Yoruba Richin, and the two of them came to us to work on this project because it's all about what you don't know mm -hmm. about Rosa Parks, a woman who you think you know her entire story, but you'd be completely wrong. Soledad O'Brien, by the way, that was very uh, professional of you to mention all of those different names that are uh, contributed to this project. Yeah. Rosa Parks, for those who don't know, we often have debates on this show about um, how we cover history. A lot of folks don't want to go back in time. Right. Why we got to look back at that? Why can't we just look forward? Why we got to keep telling these same stories and talking about these same people? That was in the 50s. Why is it important to tell Mrs. Rosa Parks' story? First, because I, I think the truth matters. I actually yeah. think a lot of people get written out of history, especially black women. So mm. I think the truth just matters. Come on. And, and then I also try to understand, so like, well, why were we so comfortable with the story that I think we all heard in seventh grade, right? Which was yeah. one day Mrs. Rosa Parks was just tired, her feet hurt, she was a seamstress, right? And she just refused to give up her seat on the bus. Then there was the bus boycott, and then it ended, the end. Mm -hmm. The reality is she had been an activist, like a hardcore activist. I mean, she supported the Black Panthers. She mm -hmm. supported Malcolm X, mm -hmm. also Dr. King, and for decades had been doing the work of an activist. And then when it came to the moment of the bus boycott, and she would tell reporters this, I'm tired, but no more tired than any other workday. Right. I'm tired of being treated badly. And she said, in fact, that she was thinking of Emmett Till at the moment that she refused to give up her seat mm -hmm. on the butt. Right. So this is not a woman whose feet hurt. This mm -hmm. is a woman who decided that she would take a stand for activism. And so I'm always like, so why do we like this comfortable sort of like accidental little sweet yeah. little old lady because just... it keeps us calm in school and not make you want to think and mm -hmm. not make you want to take that same approach had we known the truth so they paint this nice calming oh she was tired kind of stumbled how... into it yes. actually right yeah. had we known when... the truth we think different yeah when she died the new york times said mm -hmm. uh, they called her the accidental matriarch and you're like there was nothing accidental <laughs> i mean rosa there wow. was nothing wow. accidental her she would talk about her grandfather when she was eight years old sleeping with his gun because he was so afraid and worried about the Ku Klux Klan. And that's how she grew up, like very, very, uh, really had complete antipathy for white people, was afraid of the Klan and angry about mm -hmm. it from her childhood. So this idea that, you know, just one day she fumbled into 
this act is just absolutely wrong. And so, you know, repeating that story, I think, is a mistake. We wanted to make Mm -hmm. sure that people understood the full work of Rosa Parks after the bus boycott. I mean, my education in Rosa Parks ended with the bus boycott. Like, Mm -hmm. then it was resolved. The end. Same. But she was a member of the NAACP. She was a secretary, recording secretary, which meant she traveled around the South to Uh take testimony, usually from black women and black people generally, who'd had uh, violent acts up, you know, acted upon them. Mm-hmm. So one of her jobs was to sit down with a woman named Reese Taylor, who had been gang raped, and to sit down and take her testimony wow. as a as a sheriff's vehicle is going back and forth, back and forth. She took a bus in, and imagine, you know, it's one of the stories that I, I like the most in this doc because I can't imagine, like Reese Taylor, who's been told if she tells anybody she's going to get killed, they're going to kill her. Yeah. And Rosa Parks is down there taking her testimony, and both of them know. It will never be resolved. Like, you are not getting justice. No. It was not illegal to rape a black woman. And so the idea that both of them are still... Wait, wait, wait. wait. The two of them are still, literally, wow. anyway, saying the truth matters. Like, the facts of the case actually matter. And so I'm going to give my testimony, knowing full well she will not get justice. And also, Rosa Parks, knowing full well, like, in that day, they will not get justice. But... The facts of it matter. And, of course, recently there was a documentary about Reese Taylor's story. She's also another woman whose courage and whose bravery helped really um, bring about the civil rights movement as Mm -hmm. a whole. Like, these women existed and did incredible things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think their stories deserve to be told. Absolutely. Soledad O'Brien, we're talking about the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, premiering on Peacock. Tomorrow, this is the first ever feature-length documentary about this activist. Right, that's crazy, huh? That's right? What? I what? literally, when I was told that, I was like, hang on while I Google that. Yeah, just unbelievable, right? Right, it really is. You know, Rosa Parks, after she, um, after the bus boycott was resolved, she was never able to get a job again. Yeah. Much, like, ever again. And they had to leave and, and move to Detroit, she and her husband. You know, but, like, I had never heard that. I sort of thought... It all went back to normal mm-hmm. at the end mm-hmm. of the bus boycott, and and that was not the case at all. Without giving away too too much, because obviously we're all going to watch this, and I'm definitely going to have my nieces watch this as well, and my nephew. What was one of the most surprising things that you've learned? Because you've only been here like seven minutes, and I'm just I feel like I'm just being slapped in the face with information I just did not know. Did you feel that way? Dis- Absolutely. I, 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 I would have told you, like, I have a pretty good grip on the story of Rosa Parks. Like, mm-hmm. I've done a bunch of talks. I've, and I realized that I didn't because the degree to which she was an absolute hardcore activist from the get-go, there was mm. no nothing accidental about her story. And, in fact, one of the historians in the doc talks about, you know, if people knew, they might be a little more afraid of Rosa Parks. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, and, and so, again, you know, why when they were honoring Rosa Parks when she died, right, they, she was, a, you know, she was able to, you could view her body in the Capitol, a very rare honor. That was rare for very, them to do that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But that was the same moment that everyone's eulogizing Rosa Parks, with the left hand, on the right hand, they are undermining voting rights for black people. You know, the Supreme Court was doing that, right? So simultaneously talking about her fight for, for equal rights while literally undermining it at the same time. And so it's those things that I think really kind of surprised me at every turn, that she mm-hmm. was involved in protest mm-hmm. every single step of the way. There was nothing accidental about her story at all. Mm-hmm. Wow, Soledad O'Brien is here. Um I remember also reading about Claudette Colvin, right, uh, not, uh, prior to Rosa Parks. Yeah, she was 15 years old, and she was a young woman who was really the first mm-hmm. wo- um, young person, a woman, who sat on the bus, refused to give up her seat. And she was, in a lot of ways, I was told, not considered to be a, a great candidate for a court case. Mm-hmm. She was 15. We actually interviewed her. She's still alive. And she's still she's, here? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. She's in the dock? She's not in, well, oh, oh, her story's oh, oh. in the dock, but <laughs> no, okay. no, for okay. the, sh- the, I anchor a show called Matter of Fact. We okay. did a whole profile on her the other day. Oh, God. Really? Yes. Like, she's uh, very much alive, like alive and well and running around. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Claudette Colvin is here. You should call her up. She's amazing. You but got her did info? you know, yeah, I can get it to you. Thank Claudette you. Colvin was a mentee of Rosa, Rosa Parks. Wow. They knew each like I did not know that they actually knew each other. I sort of thought there was this one, she wasn't considered sort of a good 
test case for uh, any kind of legal battle, Rosa Parks was sort of a better case. But actually, Rosa Parks did a lot of work with young people, young women specifically, and they knew each other. She was her mentee. What wow. does it mean, Soledad, right? when they say she Crazy. wasn't a good oh. test case? Like, what? in what way? Uh, Claudette was 15, She so she was young, she was pregnant, she was not considered to be... What they loved about Rosa Parks was that she uh, was married, she had a job, she, was, she came across as very uh, stately wow. and dignified. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how she presented, and I think that's a very typical thing in modern-day um, legal cases as well, right? Is this person... Are they going to be seen in the public as a good test for something you want to challenge in the courts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything that you're sharing, Soledad, um, it reminds me that so many of these major figures in our history were working on our behalf. You know, they weren't necessarily having this craving for results they would experience but it was really a delayed gratification that they knew we would hold in our hands and our experience. And so I wonder if that is something that brings you a sense of calm in your work, like knowing that, okay, I won't see the fruits of my labor, but they will be enjoyed by the future. Yeah, I think that's really, really true. I think especially when it came to civil rights justice, there was a sense that you're working toward a thing down the road. You yeah. know, my, my parents, who were an interracial couple back in the late 1950s, mm-hmm. my oh. mom used to talk about um, when they moved, my mom was Cuban, black and Cuban, my dad was white and Australian, and my mom used to talk about what it was like for them in Baltimore in 1958, and then after when they got married, and then after when my two older sisters were born. And she would say, you know, people would spit on them as a friend. I was like, what? Wow. Crazy. But I used to ask her all the time, like, oh my God, what did you do? And she'd say, you know, we knew America was better than that. You know, which was kind of a similar thing. Like, we're going Mm. to exist because we understand that there's a thing down the road Mm. Uh that we need to get to and we can contribute to in some capacity. And we have to, you can't just opt out. Yeah, You can't just say, well, you know, it doesn't affect me. It's not important to me. Or, you know, I'm just going to move to Detroit. You Mm -hmm. actually have to continue to be in the fight. And I think when it comes to civil rights, I like the idea of making sure that people understand it's a long battle. Like, it's not one day you just accidentally decide. It's no. In fact, it the true story is you get up and day after day after mm-hmm. day, decade after decade after decade, you fight yeah. hard. Mm-hmm. And because Dr. King was moving a direction, she supported that. Yeah. And because Malcolm X was moving the same direction in a different way, mm-hmm. she supported that. And because the Black Panthers were moving that direction, doing a bit of a different thing, she supported that. So I like the version that is not the mythology. I mm-hmm. like the version mm-hmm. that it's this shit is hard work and it's over and over and over again. And don't for a minute think that someone won't turn around and take it from you mm-hmm. because they will. We've mm. seen that happen in 2022. Come on. Come on. Soledad O'Brien is here. We're going to open up these phone lines. 888-742-3345. We're talking about Miss Rosa Parks, but we're also talking about Soledad O'Brien. Yes. In the current times. <laughs> All right. Give us a call. 888-742-3345. Sway in the morning, say four five. We're talking with Soledad O'Brien, the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, premiering tomorrow on Peacock. If you have any questions, 888-742-3345, or just comments. We have a- Alfie on the line from Baltimore. Hi, Alfie. Alfie. Alfie, what good up? Good morning, good morning. How y'all feeling this morning? Hey, beautiful. Hi, Alfie. Hey, good morning. Good morning, uh, Tracy. Miss Heather B, hey. Miss O'Brien, and Hi. the man Sway. Hey, hey, hey. What up, Alfie? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, quick question, uh, and it's amazing that I just, I had, to, I'm in here doing a little um, information. I'm, I'm from Baltimore. So I'm in here, you know, researching on redlining in Baltimore and how mm. segregation started here in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And I heard you saying that your parents had grew up in Baltimore back in the 50s. Yep. And and I would I would like you know can would you be able to elaborate a little bit about that and also you know I would like to talk to you as well 
Yeah, absolutely. So my my dad was from Australia. My mom was Cuba from Cuba. And when they came to this country, they were both at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Uh, but when they got married, interracial marriage was illegal in the state of Maryland and then 16 other states in the nation as well. And when I tell college students that, <laughs> that my parents' marriage was not legal until after my little brother was born. So they had six kids. I mean, it was legalized in 1967. Ah, like, right? That's embarrassing. Oh, it's so bad. And so, you know, my mom used to say, like, if you wait for people to get with what you're doing, you might be waiting a long time. You just mm-hmm. you know, have to kind of do what you're going to do. Uh, so, yeah, I think they really liked Baltimore. They spent a lot of time there. But also they recognized when my parents, they passed away a couple of years. Mm-hmm. I got um, I got all their paperwork back You know, went through their paperwork. My dad had listed himself as Negro on my sister's birth certificates. Really? And wow. I, I don't know, just for the two of them, for the rest of us, once we moved to New York, I grew up in Long Island, we, the, he was listed as white. He was white, and he was, like, very white. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. There was no confusing him. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, God, I wish I'd been able to ask him, what did, was it just assumed and someone wrote that down? Did my dad have it written down? Like, what was the reason uh-huh. behind that? Maybe I, it was your mama's Cuban cooking that made him just forget. <laughs> 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 it just transformed them all away. But Baltimore is an interesting city. We're about to start another doc in Baltimore about water. Is all I can really water. say about yeah. You know, in a lot of the infrastructure in a lot of American cities is a disaster. Yes. Uh, not surprisingly, accord um, you know correlated with black um, mm-hmm. an, an under uh, funded mm-hmm. and under resourced. So we're about to start a big project that looks at uh, at water and infrastructure in America centered in Baltimore. Alfie, you had you you wanted to ask her one more because I sound like you were in the ball more in the 60s and you're wondering if you knew her parents uh, no <laughs> no actually <laughs> I, i'm 77 but you know i don't really want to tell my age <laughs> but, you but, sound um, amazing yeah, you sound what great man Jeez. like a marathon man, i was going to invite you to the strip club you sound that active <laughs> I you, can still go. you can still go okay so you- i would love to yeah, no, I would say I would love to talk to you about some things that you know I'm working on here in Baltimore. You know, some documentaries as well. But a uh, quick little fun fact about Baltimore as well. Uh, there was a park here called Green Oak Park back in '60. I think I'm gonna say '63, where it was segregated. And Martin Luther King had a speech when he did his speech in '63 about little kids playing in the park. It was actually about a little girl. First time she rode on this on um. Uh, what's that? The Murray Go Round, and they had that Murray Go Round in D.C. is is a is a memorial now, and she lives in California. And she got she wrote a, a children's book as well. Oh wow! Okay, Alfie, thank you. Make yes. sure you follow Soledad at Soledad O'Brien on all her social. Okay, you can shoot her a message, DM her. I don't, I'm, I'm yeah, sure she's absolutely. active. Okay, mention that you met her on the show. Okay. I really appreciate it. I'm about to do it now. I appreciate it, y'all. Enjoy your day, and I love talking to you guys. Hey, Alfie, it's an honor to have you tune in to us, bro. So I want to say thank you, and you're a super citizen. Let's wait in the morning. God okay. bless. Uh, wow. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go to Harlem. Matt, you got a quick Harlem. question? Harlem World. Yo, good morning. Yo. Good morning, Grant. What's up? Hello, Ryan Grant. My bad. <laughs> you good. I'm with Soledad. I, I, I really... You, you really caught me on guard with some of the information you hit me with as I'm driving to an interview to be a substitute teacher. Ooh, I like that. Mm-hmm. Good. As, as an educator or a soon-to-be educator, would you teach the kids of today, like I'm trying to do sixth grade, six to eighth graders, would you teach the kids today the book of today on Rosa Parks or just close the book on that and teach her the real story of Rosa Parks? coming through your uh through your documentary i'm i feel like you might be a plant because it so happens we have created a curriculum for middle school students let's go uh, right around um gene theo harris's book that is really underscoring the real story of rosa parks and so we can actually get that to you and we started handling it out already uh, we were um uh, we got a lot of help from the Ford Foundation on that. They were really all over that, so we appreciate it. But there is uh, lots of educational help uh, to teach kids the real story about Rosa Parks, and I love telling the real story. Mm-hmm. I also think young people get it. Like, they're not confused by nuance and contradiction and, you know, well, why would she do this and why would that happen? Why would it be spun this way? I sometimes think their answers are, are very understanding, uh, and sometimes I think grown-ups are a little more um, unable to, like, 
understand that someone can like Dr. King and and Malcolm X, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like right. it kind of blows their mind. Mm-hmm. Right. And I I think young people are like, no, I I get it. She's you know aiming for a bigger goal. So yeah. we can absolutely get you know if you um if you hit me up on uh, on Twitter, I'll make sure that our uh, education team uh, gets you a copy of uh, of that book and the resources for your class if you like. Hey Matt, congratulations. Oh, I'm with that. All right. I'm with that. Thank you, man. Have you a bet. beautiful day, substitute teaching. Oh, no, exciting. I okay. love that. Good All luck right. on the interview. We're proud of you, bro. Yes, yes, thank okay. You. Thank you. And thank you. Y'all, y'all always been there for me, man. Yes, indeed, uh-huh. man. You and your family, man. I'll see you in Harlem. Yeah, he's right. not a plant, yes, so sir, daddy calls here a lot. <laughs> All, right. All right, you're a citizen, brother. He just brother. teed me up to, to talk <laughs> about my he did. Like, Our oh, citizens look. know how to do this. Uh, Tracy, why don't you take it home? Well, so I would love your journalistic perspective on something because we had a conversation about um, the American serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm and this series that is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And also we're always just having conversations about where does journalism and entertainment, where do they cross, where are their separate lines? And one of the mothers of the victim who lost his life at the hands of Jeffrey Dahmer, she's very upset. One, because a lot of people are dressing up as, as him for Halloween. And then two, because she feels like Netflix is profiting off of these murders and that if you're going to do even though it's not a docu-series technically but it's based on true life um right they take testimony from the actual cases and then they turn that into the actors lines and, and words yeah in your perspective do you feel like when that is done that there should be a portion of the profits that is given to the victims families you know, I personally do because I just think it's very uh, – I have always liked in my projects to bring the people who are involved along. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's hard, but, I mean, I think I think it's just you get a better product at the end. And also it must be like being hit over the head with a two-by-four. Yeah. Imagine yes. like you've spent Gotta all these years, right? Yeah. And, and then you look up one day and suddenly you know nothing about it. No one's asked you much about it. And then all of a sudden there's an actor portraying your son. Right. And then and your testimony in court is being with your actual words is being said on Netflix and somebody is making a fair amount of money off of it. So I don't think there's an official rule about it, but I have always found and I don't do a ton of of non of of scripted. Right. Mm -hmm. We do a lot more, you know, documentary and scripted. But even in documentary, we I want people to participate. I want them to feel like, listen, this is your story and you get to be part of this story. And you have to tell them that, uh, you know, if we're producing it, then it, it is ours, right? We own it. And and everybody has their point of view. But I like to be informed by the people who are there. And projects we have done, we have not paid people. I don't like paying people for interviews. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you'll say, listen, we would love to have you work on the promotion for yeah. this stuff. We would love to, to buy your photographs and mm-hmm. things Got like that you. that seem more fair and not just using people's stories. Mm-hmm. I think that is just really... I think that's hard. I feel so badly for grieving families. That, yeah. the, that part to me is, I think it just comes out of the blue, right? And then all of a sudden it just brought, a, a girlfriend of mine lost her uh, her daughter in the Newtown school shooting. Wow. And she just, you know, she writes about it a lot on Twitter, how every school shooting that happens, her phone's ringing and it just mm-hmm. all comes back up again. And they happen a lot. And, and, you know, then she just feels very exploited by it over and over again. And mm. I only say that because she talks a lot about it mm-hmm. on social media. And it just breaks your heart. Yeah. Like, I just think it's, you know, I can't imagine if someone were ever to say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you in that film about it. And, oh, and this little actress is going to, you know, that could you imagine the yeah. heartbreak of that right. parent? Yeah. I, I can't even imagine. Can't so, even imagine. Yeah. Thank you for your um, honesty and transparency. Yes. Appreciate that. So Thank that you for O'Brien. having me. Absolutely. We pleasure, love having you. Yes. I love it. Thank you. I really you're, appreciate you're it. You're a unicorn in this, in this <laughs> right now in this Come game. On. <laughs> you see what's happened with, you know. I ain't got to tell you. Mm. <laughs> We need you here. Mm. Soledad O'Brien, big round of applause for Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, premiering tomorrow on Peacock. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Continue success. Thank you, thank you.